Why did that guy get such easy trials? Is he favored by Zeus or something? Okay, okay, okay. sure if I am live just yet. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, hello. I am Melanie. I am here at the wonderful Books of Wonder in New York City, and we are so thrilled to be here for this event after that super fun, um, really great video. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, that was so great to watch. Um, and yeah, we are just about to start a live uh, Q&A portion with some questions that we've pulled from our lovely audience members. Hello, Rick. How are you today? I'm doing good. Somehow I didn't fall in the fountain at the public garden, so that's a good start. Uh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's hear I the was, questions. I was on the edge of my seat, but um, <laughs> I'm, glad. I'm glad everyone made it out okay. Um, all right. Um, so if you're ready, let's get into some questions, yeah? Totally, yeah. Great. Um, so I have them pulled up right here on my electronic device. Um, so I guess first, right off the bat, um, from lovely reader Cami Phillips, we have um, the question, are you planning on writing any more books in this universe? Um, I've seen so many great ideas for stories while reading your books, um, and I would hate to see you stop writing entirely. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks, Tammy. Well, I mean, this is the end of the the big story arc. There won't be any more huge five book series, I don't think. The reason for that is I kind of want to try something different and just do standalones, perhaps for a while, so I can sort of uh, pivot more quickly from one idea to another. Um, that's not to say that I couldn't explore side characters, or certain stories, and and standalone novels. Um, once you get into the Tower of Nero, you'll see that I've kind of peppered a few little ideas and Easter eggs in there that could become, you know, spin-off standalone novels at some point. But I also have a lot of other ideas that aren't Percy Jackson related that I want to explore too. Uh, so exactly what that looks like and what is coming next, we'll have to see. Well, it looks like we certainly have a lot from Rick Riordan Presents to hold us over as well. That oh, absolutely. Very exciting. Um, great. Next question is from Sam Cannon. Um, do you prefer writing in third or first person? Hum, uh, I, I like them both. I guess I, it's easier for me to think in first person. Uh, when I first started Percy Jackson, obviously I did that. And at the time, it really wasn't something that you saw a lot in middle grade fiction. Uh, and people were like, oh, you can't do that. You can't do like a children's book in first person. Uh, but for me, I mean, I, I kind of cut my teeth on mystery novels, like the hard-boiled private eye stuff. And so that was really a very natural way uh, to do that kind of book. And it just kind of carried over. And it, it made perfect sense to me, like that snarky first-person uh, you know, narrator. But when you have seven characters, like, for instance, in The Heroes of Olympus, it, it, that doesn't work so well. You, you kind of have to go back and forth from, from different points of view. So I like them both. Great. Um, next question from Raina Shea. Uh, what is one scene you're looking forward to filming and seeing in the Percy Jackson live action TV series? Oh my gosh, all of them. I, I am so looking forward to everything about it. Uh, we're not there yet. I mean, we're still in the writing phase and that's got to be nailed down just perfectly. So we're taking our time. We're making sure we got that right. Um, so the filming, that's later, but there's a lot of different um, ways we're looking at doing this. Like, for instance, we could do some uh, location visits. Uh, we also might have access to um, the rig, which is the virtual environment where they, for instance, film The Mandalorian, and they do it like all there in the room, but they do amazing things with it. So uh, it, we have a lot of very cool toys that we can maybe play with. Um, I, I am especially looking forward, I think, to the uh, the St. Louis Arch scene uh, mm -hmm. because we haven't gotten to see that ever. So that'll be fun. Oh, that's so exciting. It's something to look forward to. Um, great. From Ash Arana, um, 
For Uncle Rick, would you be able to teach over Zoom if you had still been teaching now? Yeah, you know, Becky and I, my wife, we were talking about that um, the other day. And first, I mean, I have to say, yeah, as a classroom teacher myself, my heart goes out to teachers. I mean, as if teaching isn't hard enough, you know, then this year rolls around and wow, I mean, we're asking a lot from our teachers. So kudos to all of you uh, that, are, that are trying to, to figure through this. I, I, I can only imagine how, how hard it is. Um, having said that, I guess I think I could have probably adapted to Zoom. I, I was always kind of uh, known for being into the, like the, the latest tech. I mean, when you know, websites back in the dinosaur times when we websites, I was one of the first to have a website and put my mm -hmm. curriculum on the website and use social media and use, um, you know, video editing tools and stuff. So I think I would have enjoyed a lot about teaching uh, virtually, although, of course, it, it's not the same as, as being able to be there with your Great. Um, awesome. All right. Um, cool. Sorry, you got to you broke up a little bit there, but I think we're back. Um, Nick, oh, okay, I'm here. No, you're here. I hear you. Uh, Nikki Poulos writes, um, do you think you'll ever write a YA Percy novel or a YA novel in general for that matter? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of readers that uh, started the books you know, as younger kids and have kept reading them. And I'm really grateful that uh, the readers have stayed with them and have continued to enjoy them. Uh, you know, I've got readers that are eight years old and I've got readers that are 80 years old. And like I usually say, I mean, if you enjoy the book, you're the right age for the book. My, my mindset, though, because I was a middle school teacher and because that's kind of you know, sort of um, creatively and mentally where I live, whatever, you know, that tells you about me. Uh, that's my sense of humor. That's kind of my sensibility. And that's sort of where I target uh, the books, like sixth grade to eighth grade. Um, I I'll tell you that I was a high school teacher for one year. I didn't like it. And I went right back to middle school because it just, I don't know, the rapport was better and I just got that, that age group better. So I, that doesn't bode well for me trying to write a novel from a slightly older sensibility. Um, so I don't know. That's, that's not something I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how that would go, but well, you know, I'll keep it in mind. <laughs> never say never. Um, great. Uh, Miss Michaela asks, which character, which side character has been the most fun to write in the Apollo series? Oh, gosh. I love Meg. I mean, Meg McCaffrey is just, uh, she's a firecracker. Uh, she's so fun, and she's having so much fun bossing uh, Apollo around and trying to keep him, you know, um, on, on task. Uh, she's, she's got a hard job there, you know, trying to teach this uh, former god how to be a, a somewhat decent mortal. Uh, so I, I think she's my favorite. Although, of course, it's also wonderful to be able to use the Apollo series to go back and visit all the characters that we met in uh, Heroes of Olympus and Percy Jackson. Uh, it's It's been kind of like, it's felt like sort of like the, a victory lap. You know, you just sort of go by and yay! And you're, you're seeing all those characters again and getting to see what they're up to. So that's been great. Oh. Um... Next question is from Amber. Um, what is one thing that you regret that you did or didn't do while writing your Percy Jackson series? Is there something you would add, change, or remove? I mean, writing um, is a form of evolution, personal level. I mean, writing it to everything would be Because I'm saying play that week, Boulder, 2002, when I started thinking about this book. So it's difficult to say exactly what, but yes, I mean, books, you know, they're kind of like uh, photographs. You know, you snap that photo, and it's it's a recording of the time that it was taken. 
and, and books are the same way. And, you know, for better or worse, that's, that's what I wrote back then. Uh, and I, I try to evolve with the books. So readers will have to be the judge of whether that, you know, that came across okay or not. Lovely. Um, great. Um, Elizabeth Purcell asks, what, what advice would you give uh, to a writer who wants to write a series right off the bat? Okay. Um, well, I love series as, as a reader. That's why I started with series. And that, that's just kind of my personal preference. I, I don't think that there's really too much difference in writing just a single novel and writing uh, a series. I mean, the, the approach I would recommend is pretty much the same. Um, put everything you have into that book. Even if you think it's the, you know, the first of many books, don't hold back. Don't uh, say, oh, well, I'm going to save this cool stuff for the second book. Don't do that. Just write the most bang up, wonderful novel you possibly can. Um, and in terms of process, you know, everybody's different. But basically, the three things I usually tell people are read a lot, uh, because that's where you're going to kind of get ideas about what the sort of story you like looks like. The second thing is write a lot, because you only learn to write by writing. It's, it's like a participation sport. You have to do it to get better. And third thing, uh, also very important, don't give up. Uh, because the, you know, the writers that weren't published, the, the only thing they have in common is you know, they gave up. So if you stick with it, uh, you will get rejected. Sure, I have lots of rejection notes. Uh, but you will eventually, I believe, find a place for your, for your book. Lovely advice. Thank you. Um, question from the lovely Phoebe. You made Percy Jackson the character for your son so he felt less alone. Was Nico inspired or inspired by or made for someone specific? Um, I'm a gay Italian immigrant and he helped me a lot growing up. I'd love to know how or why he came to be. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, not for anyone specific. The name Nico is is named in honor of a student of mine, uh, as as are a lot of the the characters in the Percy Jackson and other series. But uh, no, Nico wasn't really for anyone particular. Although, you know, as as a middle school teacher, I've taught thousands of kids and I've gotten to be part of their lives. And middle school is just a really tough time. Uh, no matter who you are or how you identify. You're finding out so much about who you are and, you know, where you fit into the world. And, you know, I've had lots of kids uh, from all different uh, backgrounds and, and, you know, gender identity and sexual orientation. And I just wanted to say, you know, I remember you. Uh, you were in my classroom. Uh, th these are not like abstracts to me. These are actual kids. And I've seen you struggle. Um, and I'm not going to erase you. I'm, I'm going to make sure that at least you know that in, in this universe, all demigods are welcome. You know, all kids are important. And it's really, really critical that every kid feels like, you know, they're seen, they're, they're valued. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, yeah, that was a great question and great answer. So thank you, Phoebe. And thank you, Rick. Um, Da -da. Uh, Amy asks, the Magnus Chase series is only three books as opposed to five, like your other series. Um, was there a reason for this? I know that me and many others want more. I love Magnus Chase. Uh, I think my, my reason, like the Kane Chronicles was a trilogy, and Magnus Chase was a trilogy. My, my access to, my access to um, some of the source material, there, there just isn't as much written. We, we don't have as much to draw on, at least that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. uh, of Norse mythology or of Egyptian mythology. So it's a little tougher to find enough content to fill a five book series. Now, I would, I would love to revisit those characters. That would be super, you know, maybe that's another standalone novel idea. Magnus is very near and dear to my heart. Oh. I know we all love Magnus, especially in Books of Wonder. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a great question. Uh, Dylan asks, um, do you ever see anything redeeming in your villains, like Kronos, Ares, the Triumvirate, etc.? I think the villains have to be understandable. I mean, they have to be in some way, at least, I don't know if sympathetic is the right word, but you have to know where they're coming from. 
um, you have to sort of say, okay, I, I get why they're doing what they're doing, and I can see why somebody would get to that point. They have to be human, the, even if they're not human, even if they're a titan or a god. Um, there has to be something about them that's a, that makes the reader say, okay, yeah, I mean, I, I can see why somebody would be tempted to act that way, you know, whether it's anger or jealousy or envy uh, or, you know, love turned bitter or whatever the motivation is. So, yeah, I do feel, I don't know if kinship again is the right word, but I do feel an understanding, uh, sort of a link to the villains. Uh, I love that question. Um, great. Uh, blah, blah. Oh, Deanna asks, what are some of the best ways to gather information about myths and cultures when writing a book? Where do you draw from? Well, I mean, as much as possible, the primary sources, uh, you know, go back to the earliest tellings that you can find and read, read, read everything. I mean, Hesiod, Homer, obviously, the, you know, the Greek and the, uh, the Roman um, writers, uh, there, there are so many. I mean, Greek and Roman mythology changed in itself over the centuries, yeah, even when it was, um, you know, what we call the classical period when, um, when the Romans were still around and the Greeks were still around. Even in that time frame, uh, the mythology changed tremendously. And who Artemis was wasn't the same in, say, Sparta as it might have been in Ephesus and how she was worshipped, how she was seen, would not have been the same. Uh, so there's a lot of variety. Um, so I, I try to read as much as I can. There are some great websites um, that, that are linked on my website, in fact, if people want to check them out. Um, Robert Fagels has a really great um, translation in English of the Iliad and the Odyssey that I always recommend. Um, so, yeah, just read a lot. Great. Um, let's see. Ah, Brandon asks, I'm a 29-year-old teacher and was wondering what you would tell your 29-year-old teacher self about what you know now in terms of <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, let's see. When I was 29, I was not yet published. Uh, I was working as a middle school teacher, yes. Uh, I had quite a few years left, uh, still to go in my teaching career before I, I became a full-time writer. Um, I would I would probably say... I would probably say that, um, you know, don't, don't be too hard on yourself. Uh, I, I tend to be very hard on myself and want to do everything just right. Um, and you'll always get to be a teacher, even if you're not in the classroom. Um, and I would also say, you know, just um, don't worry so much about the small stuff. If you can, concentrate on really just appreciating uh, the time that you have with your students and getting to know them as people. Um, and, you know, understand that someday uh, they're going to come back and they're going to, I think, show you exactly uh, how you helped them, hopefully, and, and how, you know, how rewarding that's going to be. Because uh, now I have kids that come back and they're adults themselves and they've become teachers, they become classical scholars, they become doctors, you know, they've had all these wonderful career paths, but they still remember that time we had in the classroom, and they still value it and cherish it, and that's just a, you know, that's priceless. I think that's great advice for, for teachers and for general readers and viewers. <laughs> but, um, all right, um, let's see. Ah, Connor, uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but Connor asks, uh, creating character names has always been difficult for me. What's your thought process when naming specific characters? Yeah, it is, it's hard. Uh, I just try to find names that I think are really interesting. Uh, they can't be, um, they can't be too um, much for me to pronounce and they can't be I mean that's just my own thing you know they like I have to be able to say okay you know I understand this name and it makes sense to me it fits the character they can't be too long or too complicated to spell that's again that's just me because uh, it, it it'll be difficult for me but they they need to be um, a little bit unusual just so they're not completely uh, normal. I mean, I, I, 
whatever that means. I mean, like there's no like Johns or, you know, Bills really, because I, I want something that's a little more, um, I don't know what the word is, a little more interesting. Uh, like I, I, I sometimes go back to um, like names that were popular around the turn of the 19th century. You know, what was popular then? Because they sound a little bit antiquated, but that kind of makes them in a, in a way seem fresh. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but I just look for interesting sounding names. Uh, and, you know, another thing is you can't have like five characters in one book that all have a name that begin with N or S um, because it'll just get confusing. Visually, it's confusing to know who's speaking. That's a great answer. I love that uh, little fun fact about the turn of the 19th century. That's so, yeah. so fun. Um, great. Lisa Lipinski asks, uh, or rather states first, as a parent, I applaud you. And then uh, asks, when you started writing uh, all of your series, was your intention, um, you know, aside from starting it for your son, like we discussed before, um, was your intention to get kids more into Greek mythology or any mythology? I mean, I feel like there's so many kids, especially that come into Books of Wonder, and they're like, I want more books on Greek mythology because I love Percy Jackson or Egyptian mythology or something like that. So, Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I take my writing kind of the same way I, I took my, my teaching is that I wanted to make it engaging and I wanted it to seem relevant and exciting. So kids were really looking forward to coming into my class rather than saying, oh, no, Mr. Ryan's class again. Uh. <laughs> you know, and so whatever we were covering, I wanted to make it so uh, engaging that maybe they didn't even realize that they were learning. You know, it, was, it just like was a fun activity. But yes, absolutely. I'm always trying to teach. I'm, I'm sort of subversively kind of putting the mythology in there or whatever the content is uh, to try to get them interested in, in reading and in mythology. Yeah. Great. Well, I think that I think you certainly accomplished that a little bit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, at least on my end. But um, great. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, so we have one. Uh, Mason Fernandez asks, did you ever expect that Percy Jackson in your writing would be as popular as it is today. Percy was my hero growing up, um, a person I often aspired to be like. Did you think that your books would have that much of an impact on your readers? No, not, not at all. Um, it's still really hard for me to wrap my mind around. I mean, it was just a story for my son. It was very personal. It was his representation. You know, he had uh, learning differences, and Percy was kind of his myth to kind of say, that's, that's okay. You know, difference is a strength. And it, in this case, is a sign you're a demigod. Um, but then, you know, he liked it. And so I, I let my students read it and they liked it and they told me I should get it published. And, you know, here we are all these years later, but it was a really gradual thing. It's not like overnight, boom, you know, I was a full-time writer and they were on the bestseller list. It took, it took a lot of years of visits with, with, uh, teachers and librarians and, and going to schools and kind of talking about the books. And it kind of had this snowball effect over time. So by the time I realized that it had really kind of taken on a life of its own, I was like, what just happened? <laughs> so no, I was not prepared for that. Got it. Um, well, I'm certainly glad that, I'm certainly glad that we've gotten as much out of it as we have. Um, all right, and then um, for our last question, Evan Miller asks, your inclusion of LGBT, LGBT characters has meant a lot to me. What gave you the inspiration and courage to write about LGBT people um, in so many wonderful capacities? And thank you for doing so. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, um, that it's resonated for you, and I, I'm glad, I hope, that, that it comes across, um, you know, as, as best it can coming from me and, you know, an old cis white guy. But... <laughs> Um, you know, I, I mean, again, it's, it's all for my students. I mean, these are not, these are not just like, you know, labels to me. They're not just like, you know, different like things I have to check off a list. I mean, these, these are my students. Um, I don't think there's a single character in any of my books that isn't in some way based on the experiences of kids I have known. Um, and for all of them, I, I want them to know that I haven't forgotten them uh, and that, you know, when, when the kid, you know, whoever that kid is, 
raises their hand and says, can I be at Camp Half-Blood too? Or, you know, can I be at the Hotel Valhalla? The answer is always, absolutely. Of course you can. You know, you, you are uh, just as valid as, as everyone else. And of course, you know, I'm not going to be perfect at it. Um, you know, my, my worldview is such that, you know, I'm always trying to expand it, but it is what it is. And, you know, I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, but, you know, I, I, um, I do the best that, that I can, and I try to learn from uh, my mistakes. And, you know, I hope that for uh, the majority of readers that it works, it works for them. And uh, so, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Um, I think that's it for our questions, but um, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of Books of Wonder and all the people that have tuned in and everyone watching. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. It's been such a pleasure um, and just an awesome, great time. Um, so thank you, Rick. And, Absolutely. Uh, thank you, guys. And it was really great hanging out with everybody this evening. Of course. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you. There's a whole, you know, to people watching their so many people that helped make this happen. So thank you all. And, but mostly thank you guys for tuning in and thank Rick. And um, just a reminder that you can buy signed copies of uh, both Rick's newest book and um, Kwame Mabalia's newest book signed from Books of Wonder. There should be a link right at the bottom of your Crowdcast page, um, as well as in the chat. If you want to snag those up, um, I suggest, you know, hopping on it and hopefully you've all uh, either ordered or read it and enjoyed it and enjoy all the great stuff that's coming from Rick and his imprint and everything. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much. And I think that we're just